Welcome to Sketchy. We take all the super complex stuff you need to learn and turn them into memorable visual stories packed full of everything you need to know on test day. Click the link in the corner or description to try for free for seven days. Now let's get to it. In this lesson, we'll introduce you to the world of oxygen transport in the body. You see, oxygen takes quite the wild ride once it gets out of the lungs and into the blood. So where better to set our scene than at a place that's filled with thrilling rides and wild symbolism? Okay, I know what you're thinking. What's so special about a fair? Well, this isn't your everyday run-of-the-mill fair. Picture this. It's 1983 Chicago, and we're taking you to the very first World's Fair, the perfect setting for a murder mystery. Get those wheels turning, because you won't believe what we have in store. <gasps> Ooh, it's okay. It's okay to gasp, all right? There's a mysterious pool of blood right here in the middle of our fair. Uh, and it appears to be bubbling. Well, isn't this a curious state of affairs? That state being dissolved oxygen. The state of oxygen in blood comes in two flavors, unbound and bound. In solutions, like blood, oxygen is free to move about as bubbles of gas. This is known as unbound oxygen. Keep in mind that while unbound oxygen only accounts for about 2% of the total amount of oxygen in blood, this state of oxygen is critical for respiratory physiology. You see, dissolved molecules of oxygen create a partial pressure, which drives the movement of gas from an area of higher partial pressure to an area of lower partial pressure. The theory behind how gas creates a partial pressure is best explained by a well-known physics principle, Henry's Law. So to help teach us this concept, we brought in another well-known Henry, Henry Howard Holmes, an infamous historical figure dubbed America's first serial killer. Naturally, Henry is standing right by this bubbling red pool, which is practically an admission of guilt, so he must be feeling some pressure. I mean, isn't that his wanted poster right there? Or maybe he's going for the whole hiding in plain sight thing. Anyway, Henry's law states that the amount of a particular gas dissolved in a solution is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas above the surface of the liquid. So, the more gas you have dissolved in a liquid, the greater the partial pressure is of that gas. All this is to say that in physiology, the partial pressure of oxygen in blood is due to the amount of dissolved oxygen, not bound oxygen. But most of the oxygen in the blood, about 98%, actually hitches a ride on a special transport protein known as hemoglobin. This is known as bound oxygen. Let our curiously hemoglobin-shaped wheel remind you that binding of oxygen to hemoglobin sets the wheels in motion to transport lots of oxygen in the blood in order to meet the demands of metabolically active tissue. This is a very efficient mode of transport because each hemoglobin molecule can carry up to four molecules of oxygen, represented by the four oxygen tanks attached to each car of this ride. You'll notice there are exactly four cars on this Ferris wheel because hemoglobin is a molecule composed of four subunits, i.e. a tetramer. Even though our wheel has just one large heme-like ring at its center, know that each subunit of the hemoglobin tetramer consists of a polypeptide chain and a heme group at its center. This all adds up to four polypeptide chains, four heme groups, and, most importantly, four oxygen binding sites. Of course, four oxygen molecules is the maximum absolute number that can bind to hemoglobin, but we can also think of oxyhemoglobin binding in relative terms, which is known as percent saturation of hemoglobin. Percent saturation refers to the percentage of binding sites that are occupied relative to the total amount of possible binding sites. So, if two binding sites are occupied by oxygen out of a total of four possible binding sites, then we can say that there is 50% saturation of hemoglobin. You'll notice we've mirrored this idea in our setup, where half of these cars have their lights on, while the other half do not. So this ride is 50% illuminated, or in other words, 50% saturated. 50% saturation is a very important physiological parameter to know about, but more on this in another lesson. One final thing about hemoglobin structure. The iron in each of the four heme groups must be in the reduced or ferrous state for normal oxyhemoglobin binding. This fact was a rather fortunate twist for us, since it provided the perfect play on words for our sketch, as noted in this ride's sign. The 2 plus in the word wheel should help you remember that Fe2 plus is the way to go if you want to effectively transport oxygen. Okay, with the basics out of the way, let's learn about the four types of hemoglobin. Starting with hemoglobin A, or adult hemoglobin, 
represented by this adults-only ride at the fair. This is the same Ferris wheel we've been studying, but you'll notice that we've added a few key details. The bottom two alpha-shaped cars and the two sets of beta-shaped balloons above should remind you that adult hemoglobin consists of two alpha polypeptide chains bound to two beta polypeptide chains. But it looks like this ride is full, so why don't we take a spin on Old Rusty instead? Old Rusty is a structure that definitely lives up to the name. This oxidized behemoth of metal represents the oxidized state of iron found in an abnormal type of hemoglobin, met hemoglobin. Since oxidized iron is also known as ferric iron, we've dubbed this the ferric wheel. That's Fe3+. I don't know about you, but I'm certainly not attached to the idea of riding this rusty wheel. Much like oxygen most certainly will not attach to met hemoglobin. This is why you won't find oxygen tanks bound to any of the cars on this ride. Strangely, met hemoglobin has a greater affinity for cyanide than oxygen. Thus, checking for met hemoglobin in cyanide poisoning is very important, but more on this in another lesson. It seems like this ride's perpetually empty cars have really bummed out its attendant. I mean, he's literally blue in the face. Let this guy's blue face and red pants combo represent hypoxemia, which in the case of met hemoglobinemia is an apparent hypoxemia that is refractory to supplemental oxygen. In fact, the amount of oxygen is actually normal in met hemoglobinemia. You can try to throw all the supplemental oxygen you've got at this problem, but because oxygen cannot bind to met hemoglobin, it won't correct the underlying problem. You see, with met hemoglobinemia, oxygen delivery to the tissues is compromised, leading to tissue hypoxia and cyanosis, hence the blue box of sketchy zone clean oxia tissues. The only way to correct this stick E situation is to get iron back to its reduced state by giving certain reducing agents. Okay, let's lighten things up and take our inner child for a spin with this next ride. Enter the fetal wheel, a thrilling ride representing fetal hemoglobin, or hemoglobin F. The fetal wheel is perfectly suited for kids, or more specifically, unaccompanied infants. On the surface, it's pretty similar to adult hemoglobin, it even has two alpha chains, depicted by these two alpha-shaped cars. But instead of two beta chains, like in the adult form, there are two gamma chains. Hence why these overgrown babies are pointing these gamma-shaped slingshots at one another on this ride's top two cars. Ferris wheels and slingshots. How magnetic. Speaking of magnets, did you notice the magnet symbol on the sign here? This magnet is a helpful reminder that when comparing adult hemoglobin to fetal hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin has a much greater affinity for oxygen. This is a useful adaptation because it facilitates oxygen transport across the placenta to the growing baby. Unfortunately, just like our childlike wonder fades with time, so too does this magical molecule. Hemoglobin F usually disappears by the first year of life as gamma chains get swapped out for beta chains. With that, let's hop off this kiddie ride and get to the reason why we came to the fair in the first place. Mystery and mayhem. For our mystery buffs, look no further than H.H. Holmes. And yes, that is a sickle in his hand, but it provides us the perfect opportunity to learn about hemoglobin sickle, an abnormal hemoglobin variant found in sickle cell disease. Hemoglobin sickle, or hemoglobin S, has two normal alpha chains, but two defective beta chains. Hence the set of deformed beta balloons in Henry's non-murderous hand. These defective beta subunits result from a gene mutation leading to a critical amino acid substitution. Balloons aside, I don't really feel like getting any closer to Henry. Kinda like how oxygen is much less likely to bind hemoglobin S than normal adult hemoglobin. But before we slowly walk the other way, we've gotta address the sickle in the room. The term sickle comes from the fact that in low oxygen states, red blood cells carrying hemoglobin S become distorted, appearing as sickle-shaped rods. The deformed RBCs obstruct small blood vessels and limit blood flow, leading to ischemia, pain, and organ damage. Many devastating consequences can ensue, so it is very important to manage patients with an integrated care team to ensure their complex needs are met. Okay, now that we've characterized the types of hemoglobin, let's cover a few important definitions. We know, definitions are tedious, but don't worry, we'll make it extra fun for you. It is a fair, after all. 
The first definition we'll cover is oxygen binding capacity, which is the maximum amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin per volume of blood when hemoglobin is 100% saturated. This is captured here by this sign advertising the maximum capacity for this ride as 20 over 100. In the human body, typically one gram of hemoglobin can bind 1.34 milliliters of oxygen, and the normal concentration of hemoglobin A is about 15 grams per 100 milliliters of blood. Thus, if you multiply 1.34 milliliters of O2 by 15 grams of hemoglobin, you get an oxygen binding capacity of about 20 milliliters per 100 milliliters of blood. Again, this assumes that hemoglobin is 100% saturated with oxygen. Okay, we've got to give you a fair warning. This content may not be suitable for children, so heed this sign here and get any kiddos away from your screen. Oxygen content, emphasized by the O2 in the word content, is the total amount of oxygen per volume of blood. When it comes to physiology, this is a very important term to know. So for all you thrill seekers, let's look behind the curtain. Wow, this is next level content. The escape artist is both bound and submerged in water. Let this compounded challenge presented to our artist here remind you that the oxygen content of blood includes bound oxygen plus dissolved oxygen. So when determining oxygen content, we need to consider the concentration of hemoglobin as well as arterial oxygen saturation and the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood. If any one of these parameters is deranged, the oxygen content may be abnormal. For instance, if hemoglobin concentration is pathologically low, i.e. anemia, oxygen content will definitely be reduced. All right, so now that we've bound oxygen to hemoglobin and asked it to keep its hands and feet inside the ride at all times, let's move on to oxygen delivery. Oxygen content is critical for proper delivery of oxygen to tissues. Oxygen delivery, represented by this oxygen delivery person, is also determined by blood flow, that is, the volume of blood pumped out of the heart and through the body per unit time. Or if you're feeling particularly doctory, you can call this cardiac output. Thus, O2 delivery is the product of oxygen content times the cardiac output, or CO. The proper delivery of oxygen to tissue is essential for normal metabolic processes, and anything that alters blood flow or oxygen content can impact this. Lucky for our escape artist, the oxygen delivery is right on time. Never fear, Oxenco is here. And that's all for the introduction to our series on oxygen transport. You know, I could ride the Ferris wheel all day, but uh, maybe not with old Henry Holmes and his accessories on the loose. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do the whole metaphorically slowly back away thing and uh, meet you at the next sketch, which apparently has water and waves in it and sounds a lot safer than this. So yeah, I'll, I'll see you there.